Welcome, everybody. Today, November the 21st, no, the 24th, um, is Spinoza's birthday. 388 years ago, Spinoza was born here in Amsterdam, a city he deeply loved and admired for its freedom and its equality uh, of citizens, regardless of their religion or their ethnic backgrounds. And therefore, he dedicated a final chapter of his Tractatus Theologico Politicus to the beauty of Amsterdam. And today, the 24th of November, 388 years later, the French sociologist and philosopher Bruno Latour will be awarded the Spinoza Lens 2020 by the mayor of Amsterdam, Femke Halsema, who will speak to him later this evening. This evening is organized by the International Spinoza Prize Foundation, the Embassy of the North Sea, and Felix Meritis. Due to the COVID pandemic, Bruno Latour and uh, the Major Halsema could not join us here in Felix Meritis tonight, so parts of this program are uh, recorded before. I want to welcome you all at home following live stream of this festive ceremony and a very, very special welcome, of course, to Professor Latour joining us from his home in Paris. We are very delighted you are joining us in this program on technology and ethics that is dedicated to your works. Are you feeling comfortable? <laughs> there he is. Well, my name is Daan Rovers, I'm a philosopher, I'm a thinker laureate of the Netherlands and member of the board of the International Spinoza Prize, and I will be your host for tonight. And firstly, I want to invite sound artists Ibelise Guardia Ferraguti and Harpo at Heart to open the program with their performance. Yes, Daan, thank you very much. Um, I would quickly like to say a word about what we are going to do. Um, but first of all, I would like to say on behalf of the Embassy of the North Sea, how honored we are to be co-organizing this event in honor of Bruno Latour, because our work is very much inspired by Bruno Latour's thought and our aim to make the North Sea an independent political actor so it can be represented in our democracy is based on Latour's idea of a parliament of things. Um, apart from being one of the directors of the Embassy of the North Sea, I'm also a composer. So we made a piece of music here in honor of Bruno Latour. It's a short piece um, and it's composed for this evening, together with Ibelisa Guardia Ferraguti. And what does a piece of music need to do on such an occasion? Well, we thought, obviously, it needs to help us get down to earth. Um, and also in this COVID pandemic, you are all at home looking through your computer. You are not here, we are not together. I mean, there's a small group of people, but normally there would be a lot of you. So we wanted to give you a sense of being physically present, of being here together. And um, so you are not brains in fats, you are actually people, physical, you are part of this network of humans and non-humans and technology that is this award ceremony tonight. So in this COVID pandemic, we often get the sense that it's hard to breathe. We are not allowed to breathe in each other's direction. So with this piece of music, we wanted to create a space for us all to breathe together, loudly, freely, and safely. Um, so to get this down into our own bodies, first of all. And then secondly, it's based upon a shamanistic motive. It's called an Ikaro, um, which is also something that really in the uh, ceremonies helps the participants get down to earth. And Ibelis will shortly say something about what an Ikaro is. Thank you also for uh, inviting us. Yeah, I Icaro is actually, um, a lot of people confuse it with a song, but it sounds like a song, but actually it means literally to blow. And to blow as in to give breath 
to uh, our human uh, collaborators in this earth and our non-human collaborators in this earth. So an Icaro is a song um, that actually is received uh, by a plant. So the plant sings the song to the one that is ready to receive the song. So I borrowed this Icaro that we're going to do with Harpo from a, a very uh, deep, good friend, shaman of mine, and we're going to share that with you together with the I can't breathe mantra. <laughs> Thank you so much, 
Ibelise en Harpo. And now I'd like to invite Dafina Missidan. And she will deliver a short lecture in which she will explain a, a key issue of Latour's work, namely the question how to give voice to non-humans in politics. Please, Dafina. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the introduction. And indeed, today I would like to share with you some thoughts about how to give voice to the non-human. Now, this idea of giving voice to the non-human is also reflected indeed in Bruno Latour's work. Part of his work focuses on the parliament of things, to really give both the human and the non-human a voice in a forum in the parliament. And this way, you actually recognize the, the non-human and give it rights. Now, to some, this might seem as a far-fetched idea, right, to give rights to nature or to recognize the non-human. But this idea is also very much rooted in indigenous um, worldviews and in non-Western perspectives on nature. Now, I come to the subject as a lawyer, and I would like to share with you some examples of how certain countries have actually dealt with this in a practical way, how they have given voice to nature. Now, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to giving voice to nature is the idea that human has dominion over nature that human has um, the right to exploit nature, um, and that you actually see that reflected in laws, such as property rights, um, and also the idea of exploitation of nature. Now, this concept has long been dominant in the legal field, but what we now see is that there's more room also given to different perspectives. The last few decades, we've actually seen predominantly in global south countries, that there is another idea when it comes to this idea of ownership, actually nature becoming in and of itself and actually having rights and even legal personhood. So today I would like to share with you three examples of this. And the first example comes from Ecuador. Am I going too fast now? Ecuador, yes. And um, what is interesting about the example of Ecuador is that Ecuador actually in its constitution, which it reformed um, some decades ago, recognized Mother Earth, recognized that Mother Earth had rights, and it actually dedicated a whole chapter to what type of rights this could be. Now this chapter includes the rights such as the prohibition of extraction of natural resources in protected areas, and also the rehabilitation of soil. Now, this all stems from the Andinian uh, indigenous worldview, Buen Fuvir. Another example that we can look at is the example of Colombia. So while Ecuador actually looked at this constitution, Ecuador did the same by drafting a um, human right to a healthy environment in its constitution, but it actually took the constitutional court to recognize the, that the Atrato River actually has rights. Now, this was in relation to protecting this river from um, exploitation. So there was a lot of mining going on around this river that actually um, interfered with the quality of the water of the river, but also was um, causing damage to the communities that were living next to this river. So the Constitutional Court decided that the Atrato River has the right to protection, conservation, maintenance, and restoration. Now what is nice about this is that the government and the communities next to this river were actually given joint guardianship over this river. So they had certain enforcement um, rights to make sure that this river's quality was maintained and that all of the rights would be recognized and respected. Now this approach is also similar to the approach that was taken in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, a new bill was actually adopted which recognized legal personhood for the Whanganui River, similar to how companies have legal personhood and also people have legal personhood. Now this allowed the river to become in and of itself, no longer property of the state, and really having its own personhood. It also allowed the intrinsic value of this river to be recognized, and similar to Colombia, there were also guardians assigned over this river, and they, together with an advisory board, make sure that the rights of this river are being um, respected. Now, these examples demonstrate 
that it is actually possible to use a system which is often seen as rigid, the legal system, to actually include new and groundbreaking perspectives, which would hopefully succeed where previous environmental laws did not. And rights of nature also show that there's a possibility for reconciliation with marginalized groups that these ideas and concepts that are very much rooted in their worldviews are now finally recognized and actually being implemented after decades and centuries of oppression and struggles. So now one of the questions would be, would this also be beneficial to the global north and even maybe the Netherlands? Now what we've seen so far is that even countries in the global north are warming up to this idea. We have seen in the US, for instance, that even Lake Erie has been recognized as having legal personhood. And also in the Netherlands, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not the uh, rivers here should have this legal personhood. Examples can be seen in relation to the Vodice, um, the Maas, and of course the North Sea that we are working on here today as well. So this really shows that indeed, given voice to nature is a possibility and we can actually make it practically work and hopefully this will help us to protect nature and also make sure that future generations will have access. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dafina, for this introduction. Uh, now we're going to listen to an interview with Bruno Latour by the Dutch essayist Bas Heine. Heine will talk with Latour about his works, about the COVID pandemic, and his recent work on climate change and the parallels between these two crises. The interview will be completed by questions of three of Latour's international colleagues in order of appearance. There will be philosopher and biologist Donna Haraway, political theorist Chantal Mouffe, and philosopher of technology Peter Paul Verbeek. This interview was recorded a few days ago, and central question to it is, what does it take to develop a new philosophy and a responsible technology that can bring us back down to earth? Enjoy the conversation. I'm very glad you could do this interview and that these circumstances, they're not very festive for uh, an award program for, a sh um, for the Spinoza Lens, but I first want to congratulate you uh, with the lens and uh, I hope in the future you will be able to celebrate it in a more festive way than in these uh, difficult yes. circumstances. <laughs> uh, but as we will see in the conversation, it, it, it will play up this, this, this COVID crisis, of course, reflects in, in many ways on, uh, on themes of your work. Uh, and you have written about the COVID crisis in an article that was well read and translated all over the place and saying that now is the time to reflect on, uh, on these issues of climate change, on these issues of uh, globalization. Uh, but I first want to ask you in a more personal question, how do you cope with the COVID crisis and the, lo and the current lockdown in Paris? Oh, very badly. <laughs> the first one I was uh, interested by the experiment, but the second one, which we have now, for a month and probably for more uh, is awful uh, because yeah. it's win it's winter and then now it's uh, economic crisis is much bigger than everything, everything expected at the first uh, lockdown and I've lost a little bit of my uh, enthusiasm for the decoding of the experiment so to speak it's still very interesting but um, I find it hard I have to say yes I can well understand it's uh, the first burst of energy of making sense of all this and seeing how it reflects. And then uh, as a lot of people, I think, share that with you, that it's the, 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 the danger of depression uh, is much more stronger the second time than the first <laughs> time, I think. Um, but but, but well, we have to address it a little bit because there are two, uh, uh, if you look at today's newspapers, these two issues, what the COVID crisis, one of them, and the other one is Donald Trump, uh, reflect on on the themes of your of, of your of your work in the sense that you write in uh, in this little I think this brilliant little essay uh, Waar kunnen we landen uh, down to earth in English ou atterrir in French and you write about uh, the ascendance of Donald Trump 
and Trumpism maybe in 2016 as a kind of, um, well, as a, maybe a disaster, but a disaster we can learn from in the sense that um, he, he, learn, yes. he forces us to reflect on, 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 on these big issues. Well, four years, um, very uh, obstinately, in an incredibly obstinately, obstinate way, until yesterday, where Trump fired one of the scientists interested in climate, even though his own politics is completely uh, unscrutable and goes in all sorts of directions. On that one, that is the organization of the denial of climate change, he has been incredibly uh, consistent for four years. So uh, in that sense, uh, my hypothesis, uh, uh, what it was, four years ago exactly, uh, is unfortunately uh, exactly validated. And the political chaos that followed uh, in, in my interpretation of the United States, I mean, I just read the New York Times, I mean, it's, it's, I have no other uh, entry into it, um, was from the beginning that the climate uh, question, what I call the new climatic regime, uh, is the, not only the elephant in the, in the room, but the, the, the troop of elephant in the Oval Office, and, and, and that the rest of the brutalization and complete uh, breaking down of civility, and even the, the, actually the very divide, uh, has nothing to do in terms of cognitive uh, uh, deficit or something like that, but it's organized by the denial of the climate change. So, so in that sense, uh, it's still interesting, but it's slightly terrifying. And of course, we are slightly reassured uh, by the result of the election, but the, the attitude uh, that people can leave out completely of earth and decide to abandon because uh, the earth is submitted elsewhere to this transformation will spread. I mean, it has spread to Brazil, it has spread to India. Uh, it's, it's, it has been constant in Australia. So um, the experiment of Trump, Trump might disappear, but the, the idea that you can actually divide land in, in that way will stay, I think. Yes, because you also see him as a symbol of, of what you call uh, in your essay, the elites abandoning the project uh, maybe of, of, of universal uh, universalism uh, and and more or less escaping and you 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 write about the uh you use the example of the titanic that they use the lifeboats and and uh that's a very strong image that the elites escape from something they cannot avoid anymore and make sure that they will be saved on their little islands and or in, in their lifeboats but and that's a very strong image um, it, it's not the whole elite i mean it, it's one specific decision made by uh, some people <laughs> but they can make an alliance between uh, escapism complete escapism hyper modernism on one hand and 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 connection to a sort of very traditional uh, form of populism we use the word for for lack of a better word and this connection has been the great invention of uh, of uh, of trump i mean to try to mix uh, sort of bits and pieces of modernism uh, with an escapist uh, uh, turn into it, which was not the case before. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the United States have always been a bit escapist, but the idea was it was for everybody. I mean, everybody with American eyes at some point. The idea that uh, only uh, the very tiny, tiny portion uh, will modernize and the rest that can be lost. And simultaneously to be able to appeal to the people who would be lost, that's the genius of Trump, really. And, and this combination uh, is very efficient because it's the same in Brazil. But you see his, uh, his ascendance uh, as a wake-up call, and the other wake-up call is COVID. Um, and that reflects, in a way, to uh, what I would call the, the um, backbone, maybe, of your work, in the sense that you could see your work as a as a, a critique of modernism, uh, but in a, a radical way. And, and um, this uh, 
this 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 these crises, the COVID crisis, and and what Trump lays bare in the world, force us to rethink our whole sense of not only our relationship to the world, but also maybe what it means to be human and our relationship with what is non-human. I think that is. I think we are in in that sense maybe, uh, and I think the 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 forcefulness of your essay proves that that we are on a kind of uh, tipping point in the sense that we really now need to act or change our minds or re redirect our, 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 our views of all these themes, globalization, localization, towards a kind of new kind of uh, place to land, uh, what you call down to earth. COVID, of course, is another um, <laughs> great experiment. In four years, we had Trump and COVID. Um, it, and now we have an economic crisis. I mean, it's a, a bit too much for, for, for people, certainly. But the COVID, uh, as an experiment in uh, seeing that the connection between human is not uh, social, but as I've said for 30, 40 years, uh, made of association with non-human, uh, in that sense, it becomes common sense. I mean, so that's a good, a good thing, if I can say that. Everyone understands. I, I wrote that in my crops, the book on Pasteur uh, many, many years ago. Uh, the prime is that now it's global in a way which, of course, was unimaginable uh, in time of, of Pasteur. Global in both sense, that is, it, it took three months to be everywhere. And uh, it seems that it took a year uh, for the scientific community to find uh, a vaccine. So the two things would have been mind boggling to the Pasteurian uh, in the 19th century. But the feeling of uh, the fact that the so society is not made of, of, of social ties uh, only, and that it's made of association, uh, is the, the turning uh, point for, for, for people, of course. And also the, 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 the sort of suspension of the economic drive, which means that everybody had some time, those who were fortunate enough to have time, uh, had some time to imagine other uh, direction for their uh, activities. So in that sense, if the COVID continues, even if there is a vaccine, it would be good if we don't just go back to uh, the same uh, trajectory. Because for me, the COVID from day one uh, was a rehearsal, so to speak, a sort of preparation uh, for what will happen uh, for in the next one, which is, of course, uh, the climate uh, transformation, mutation. Uh, with the difference that there is a state tradition, the states have traditions uh, for health question, uh, and they have none yet for, for uh, ecological issues. I mean, of course, the Dutch have some because of the water question, uh, but the Dutch have always been very advanced on those questions. <laughs> I guess that's why the Parliament of Things is... Uh, uh, sensitive issues in, 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 in Holland. Every, everyone understands that. Yes. The question is, I think, if, um, if the COVID crisis passes, what will really will be changed? And that would first be a kind of mental switch, I would suppose, that people now realize that the climate crisis is here, uh, is forcing us to rethink a whole society. But, but the problem is that the, the way we handle the COVID so far, I mean, it's very different from different countries, but let's say in, 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 in Europe, uh, gives a very, uh, how should I say, bad sense <laughs> of the state intervention. I mean, that's a big problem, which is that uh, if people now hear about uh, the next state intervention for things like, I don't know, uh, abandon of oil, uh, that sort of thing, and if they mimic uh, their political reaction to what we feel now, which is unbearable intervention of a state into our daily life, there will be an immense backlash because people will say, no, no, I mean, if, if, it, if this is a, the future, we don't want to get into it. Yes. Uh, the state doesn't have the authority for that, so it, it won't happen directly, but, but the memory of the COVID crisis will uh, probably parasite uh, the set of activity which have to be done to cope with the other crisis, which is much more important in, actually in terms of health as well. 
but here it's the, literally the health of nations, uh, which is in question. And uh, that's a big problem for me because although they are linked, the two, the, two, uh, the two crises are, so to speak, embedded into one another, uh, yet the way we handle this one doesn't seem to be the ideal way to handle the, the next one. To go back to the, to, to the bigger theme, well, bigger theme, the, the theme behind this is, I think, your critique of modernity, which for a long time, and I grew up with this idea, was seen as liberating and uh, liberating uh, the individual, liberating uh, from the past. And, and you describe it uh, in, uh, first in your, in your seminal book, uh, We've Never Been Modern, as a kind of disconnectedness. It's not as a liberating feeling, but of a disconnection in, in time, uh, abolishing the past, focusing on the future, and a disconnection in space, uh, focusing on the, as you described, the global, this, this the whole uh, sense of objectifying uh, the planet or the, the, uh, the, the planet, the global thinking, uh, uh, which leaves us with no ground beneath our feet. Am I saying this rightly? It's a very simple, uh, uh, putting it into words in a very simple way. Uh, but as you say, we've never been modern because this whole disconnection was a kind of uh, illusionary in a sense. Is that the right way of putting it? Well, it, was, it had consequences. So it was not illusionary, but it, 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 it was actually divided and the, the, the division was uh, always uh, ambiguous. I mean, to be modern is to criticize modernism. So everybody has done that pretty. Uh, the point right now, but probably something starting early on, but uh, very visible at the end of the 20th century, historians debated, but basically around the 1980, basically at the famous uh, 1989 uh, turning point, the divide between the emancipation uh, uh, drive, so to speak, and uh, the material possibility of doing it uh, clashed. I mean, they had always clashed, but the, the, the idea was largely because of the availability of oil uh, and gas, uh, the impression of infinity. It has been studied by many people, by Timothy Mitchell, by uh, Michel Calon. I mean, many people have studied uh, this feeling of infinity, which uh, is actually, in, just a very small moment when you get uh, so much access to wealth uh, and oil and gas that you feel that there is no limit. And suddenly the notion of limit came back. And uh, with this completely uh, unexpected uh, consequences that the Earth system, I mean, the Earth as a system, uh, will react amazingly fast to this activity. And of course, people felt that uh, in the 19th century, there were lots of debate about it in the 18th century, but during the 20th century, as many historians have shown recently, the idea was uh, pushed aside and suddenly it flashed back when uh, at, the, at the end of the 20th uh, century. So emancipation and freedom have to be reworked. And actually I've just finished a book uh, on, the, on the lockdown, I mean, the, the lesson of the lockdown. <laughs> The lesson of the lockdown, uh, not the lockdown, of course, in my house, because that's horr horrifying, but the lockdown inside a, a territory, a, an earth, uh, which, which has its uh, a, a different, very different feel and very different size from the planet where, in which we were before. This is all my work on, on Gaia, of course. I have and lots of other questions, but we also have uh, three guests for you. Um, uh, people who, uh, uh, philosophers uh, whom you personally know, uh, some of them better than others, uh, and they all have a message for you and also have a question for you. And I, I would like just, just to uh, uh, ask the first one is Donna Haraway. Huh. And she has a, a, a personal message for you and also a question. So my name is Donna Haraway. Uh, and I have taught for many years at the University of California in Santa Cruz, but I first knew Bruno Latour when I taught at Johns Hopkins in the History of Science Department, when I was asked by the Journal of the History of Science Society to review laboratory life. 
And Bruno has been a friend of my heart, um, who his sense of humor, his capacity for love, uh, his sense of beauty, his extraordinary mental capacity, his capacity to suffer, his capacity to experience the suffering of others um, has been really remarkable. So that um, if one thinks about Bruno in the context of Spinoza, um, the substance of Bruno, uh, the, the, the refusal of binarisms, the refusal of binaries, the generativity of the substance of what is, um, his ability to practice that uh, has been extraordinary. And so I congratulate Bruno from the bottom of my heart and am particularly pleased uh, that he is now a kind of avatar of Spinoza uh, in the contemporary world. And I don't know that Spinoza had all of the companions that he needed for a good life. Now, I know that Bruno does. Bruno has companions for life, but I thought he needed another one to go with his Spinoza Lens Prize. And it's uh, so I offer Bruno this little porcelain dog uh, who is an avatar of my dog, Shindichu. She has the same ears. So Bruno's dog uh, is my um, uh, signifier of congratulations. I was asked to pose a question in relation to climate, climate crisis, climate change. Um, in relation to the metabolism of the earth that we call climate. Uh, first of all, the climate crisis is at the confluence of multiple kinds of emergencies. We live in pandemia. Uh, we live in a pandemic not just of the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease, but we live in multiple pandemics. I think of the plague of locusts killing the foods of the Middle East and Africa, killing of the peoples. I think of the pandemics in the forests, the infestations, the fungus, the diseases. I think of the rust disease in the coffee plantations, uh, killing especially the small coffee plantings of the less wealthy coffee growers. I think of the pandemics among the chickens, among the pigs, among the birds. So we live in pandemia with others, and we live in pandemia unequally, and climate crisis is part of that. He says in Aterir, in what got translated in English as uh, down to earth, he says that we don't have a deficit of ideas or a definite of cognition, deficit of cognition, that we have a deficit of practices. So my question for Bruno, who is richer than most of us in proposing practices and engaging in collaborations. His design and art collaborations are a perfectly good example. Also his work with the critical zone scientists, another perfectly good example. Bruno was good at collab collaboratories, but I want to know what he thinks now in 2020 is missing from his net bag. I want to know what Bruno thinks is the most important kind of um, gathering that he has not, perhaps not yet done or been able to think about as clearly. What kind of gathering for reconstructing, um, for, uh, reconstructing from the ground up for addressing our deficit of practices in relation to this thing we call climate? Well, this is why... Uh... I had actually, I use the word climate regime because as, as Donna very rightly says, um, it's, it's not just uh, climate in the sense of a climate scientist. It's actually a political regime like we had in the 17th century when the shift was made to nation states. So in that sense, uh, I can't agree more that it's not just climate in a, in a, in a sort of objectivist uh, sense. And to answer Donna's, uh, this is exactly what actually I'm doing today and in the, in the, in the month uh, ahead, um, in, in spite of my, my health, is uh, assembling the, from the ground up exactly what we do uh, with a group of people, a consortium of artists and uh, activists uh, with people uh, in villages and cities and uh, invited by mayors and so on on the long term to precisely uh, allow them and help them um, to uh, describe uh, the shift of, of uh, territory uh, in which we are all engaged and which, for which he proposes <laughs> a sort of pandemic or multiplied pandemics, uh, which is the right word 
people are lost. This is why I wrote this little book. And since I've written this little book, many people have asked me, <laughs> this is nice to say, we should land, but how, where mm. and how? So now I'm uh, um, every day almost now we are doing a workshop uh, with people to try to help them to exactly do this, that is make a description of the situation. If I could uh, show you my, uh, my screen, I would actually show you some example. Uh, so she's completely right. I mean, now I don't give lectures uh, academically. We are not connected to academy anyway. Anyway, I'm retired. So most of my work is uh, with people in very small villages trying to redraw, so to speak, uh, at the absolutely basic uh, level, what they feel uh, about the, the territory, the very practical soil on which they, they are. And that, to me, is the only way to land. Because if not, the, 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 the move, to move from the modernist ideal of space and time is to crash, basically. I mean, you need to redo the whole work uh, of redrawing. Uh, this is a work I do with friends of Donna, uh, Vinciane Despre, Isabel Stengers, and many others. And she's completely right. I mean, it's not just academic. No, but the, the challenge is formidable, I think, because the shift that you propose in the essay of realigning our view to uh, not towards the, the global or even to the local, because that has become impossible, as you describe rightly, uh, always leaves people and you redirect it. And you rightly write in, in your book that this sense of, uh, I translated from the Dutch now, it's the sense of ter t uh, to go back to earth, the terrest terrestrial, maybe you, terrestrial, you yeah. yeah. The sense of not the global, not the local, but the sense of this other direction that is forced upon us by this climate crisis is um, has not has no institution yet has no oh. have not not been institutionalized. So it's it's first as as you are also write a, a way of dis describing description and but to move that is is uh, to move our perception our, our, our attitude or whatever you would call it is quite uh, is is complicated because there's always as you also write the lure of the global and the lure of the local which you could say is nationalism or this new sense of identity politics in this national way or still this kind of global thinking about you know and, and uh, in abstractions and and so on so there's always this temptation to fall back on these two uh, uh way outs as they seem there may be no exits but they're they're tempting this is why the, the, the notion of, uh, of uh, to solve this question, I mean, to try to solve this question, but scale, the organization of scale on which we have lived, that is basically a cartographic ideal of the local and the global, and then the zoom from one to the other. Uh, the only way is to, is to for my, in my view, uh, to answer Donna's question, is to go through the extremely uh, personal uh, description people by people, and person by person. And that's what we do in the, in the workshop. And immediately, it's very interesting, when you do this, uh, you abandon the, the link between local and global because the, uh, it's never local, because even in a French village, people come from all over the place and they have connections from all over the place. So it cannot be projected onto a, a, a map, uh, but it is a map in a different sense. It's a map of their concern. Uh, or as Isabel uh, Stengert would say, of their obligation. And if you begin to ask them, okay, I mean, <laughs> what, what is threatened in the way uh, you subsist on this piece of, of, of land, uh, immediately the, the connection between extremely uh, practical and people basically rearrange themselves and resituate themselves. And I think that this uh, procedure, which is very slow, very uh, modest, but really from the ground up, uh, is in indispensable to shift attention and people, and of course, later institution uh, in the new climatic regime. I mean, the, the first one invented the nation state, and now we have to invent something very, very different. But this time it will not be the sort of authority of uh, uh, the princes and the imperial uh, aided later by the democratic ideal, it's something completely different. The terrestrial has a different metric. 
And actually, uh, in the book, uh, Critical Zone, that uh, uh, Donna uh, mentioned, which, which, is, which, is, well, which is right here behind me, um, where our, Donna Haraway is actually a great piece in it, and many others, uh, we try to define this metric, but it has to be defined academically and it has to be defined by these workshops. And this is also because your, your critique of modernity, uh, in one way, uh, is critiquing the objectifying of the world, make this sense of the global. But you could also say there is another critique going on at the same time, is that this, this ob objectifying of, you, of the human, in the sense that we are now uh, subjected to dataism, we are subjected to, uh, as seen as a, as a bunch of statistics, you know, and we are nudged uh, by neuroscience, we are, uh, we are seen as objects, not as subjects. So it's not only that the human, that we as a human are obje objectifying things like nature, but we're also seen as an object. And is that also part of the process that you described when you, when we, with, with your project in the villages, that people see themselves as, as a, learn to see themselves in another way than as a sense of uh, what our insurance company thinks of us or, or, or the government in a sense. Well, I've always been slightly skeptical on the notion of objectifying humans because I've studied objectivity in science and I know it, I mean, objectivity is a, a word which is very hard to reuse. Uh, there are procedures to count uh, but uh, are people really uh, confusing the accounting and themselves? I, <laughs> I really don't believe very much. Uh, anyway, that's a great advantage of being in a crisis, because uh, if you ask the very simple question, I mean, what are the conditions of subsistence that are threatened uh, according to you? I mean, your personal condition of subsistence. I mean, it's not a question of data, it's not a question of numbers, it's a question of their own existential uh, uh, link and with a place. And of course, when we begin to uh, tie those linkage uh, with others, um, other people who are saying something else in the same room, or uh, that they do a detailed inquiry in order to understand and to see the, build the controversy in which they are uh, engaged, I don't think this old uh, question of objectifying the humans is, is still very uh, visible. I, I don't really believe in biopower, uh, <laughs> if this is behind your question. I mean, look at the complete uh, chaos of the way the COVID-19 uh, is being treated uh, in Europe. I mean, it's so chaotic. People, I think, are learning a lot about the way science is produced and in a way it's slightly uh, encouraging in some sort of sense. It's very messy. Yes. And that's good because this is the way objectiv objectivity is produced. Objectivity is a very messy uh, process and uh, it, it achieves some uh, objectivity, uh, local objectivity, but obviously it's not something, it's a, it's a collective experience. I mean, we live in a collective experience. Some bits and pieces are calculated, others are not. I think people are learning uh, a lot about that. Um, and it's time for my second guest, someone you also know very well. Okay, well, uh, Bruno, I'm very pleased to have been uh, asked to con uh, congratulate you and, and participate to this celebration uh, for this Spinoza Prize. Um, it's particularly a pleasure since, you know, we've been really in touch now for, oh my God, uh, more than 15 years. <laughs> In fact, it was at the time of your pu publication of your book, uh, Politics of Nature. I've decided to uh, limit myself to ask questions related to the position that you defend in your last book, uh, 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 In this book, you say that uh, the 19th century was the age of the social question and that the 21st will be the age of the geosocial question. Uh, you say that, in fact, this move from the uh, geosocial to the ge geo, um, social to the geosocial is, in fact, a move from a system of production, production of good for humans, to a system of engendering ter terrestrial, based on the idea of activating, cultivating attachment. So you also specify that uh, those two systems are based on different principles. In the case of production is a principle of freedom. In the case of engendering is a principle of dependency. 
Uh, you also specify that by shifting from production to engendering, uh, we multiply the source of revolt against injustice. Uh, so in fact, it means clearly that you do not envisage a politic of consensus, but a politic of what we could call uh, pluralism. And it is about that that I want to clarify exactly what kind of pluralism you refer. What is the status of antagonism in your conception of, of the terrest terrestrial? Um, is there antagonism among the terrestrial or uh, should we have to abandon completely this conception of, of politics when we move from you know system of production to a system of engendering? You mentioned the fact that there is an antagonism uh, between the uh, those who be believe that they are alone in the uh, Holocene uh, and those who are in fact keen to acknowledge that uh, they live in the Anthropocene and that they cohabit with other terrestrial. Uh, so you already specified there is an antagonism, a, a conflict between those two. But what I want to know is that is there also conflict and antagonism among the terrestrial? And if there is this antagonism, what is the form that it takes? Do you think that it necessarily takes an agonistic form or can it also have a you know, purely a, a agonist, antagonistic uh, on the base of an enemy form? And that, of course, relates to another more specific question, which is linked, obviously, is what about this, uh, what you call the vector, I mean, the distinction between left and right. Should we abandon completely this distinction between left and right, or should we reformulate it? What about democracy? Because you don't speak <laughs> very much about democracy. In fact, I'm not even sure how often the term appears. So, uh, why, why don't you refer that to anymore to democracy? What is the status of democracy in, in your conception of the terrestrial? So it's basically about antagonism, agonism, and about the question of left right, and the question of democracy that I would like you to give us a few clarification. Thank you very much, Bruno. Yeah, no, they are good questions, of course. Um, and I mean, I'm not surprised by, by the question coming from Chantal. Uh, I, I, I mean, she's completely right. Antagonism is, of course, um, uh, everywhere now. Uh, first, as she said very clearly, between, let's say, the extractor, I would call them now, uh, and the terrestrial. I mean, it's a multi, multiple scenes, as we see everywhere, including we started with the other a very clear case uh, of Mr. Trump. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, are, which is of course the most difficult, are the terrestrial uh, themselves uh, in dispute? And of course uh, they are, but with a little twist, uh, which is of course that, uh, as she knows very well, the whole organization of, of, of camp uh, and, and uh, in the modernist uh, period were organized toward a, a regime of time where uh, we could actually uh, go to a sort of uh, uh, common, at least from the left and from the right, but of course in contrast, and fight with one another towards some goal. The prime of a goal of inhabiting a new uh, planet that we are discovering as we sort of move around and begin to explore other possibilities of living uh, doesn't have us this sort of uh, beautiful uh, uh, but, of course, simplifying a uh, version of, 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 let's say, party politics uh, in, the, in, the in the 19th and 20th century. So, for one very, <laughs> very difficult reason is that uh, we are divided ourselves on every single issue concerning the terrestrial. So, it's not just, I mean, there are camps, there are people who dispute, but if you take any movement like, I don't know, Extinction Rebellion, the people uh, who are like me, ad admirers of, of uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, the people who want to go from uh, geoengineering, etc. Uh, 
we every time we are divided on every single issue and that's a maybe it's transitional maybe in 10 or 20, 15 years we would have organized these fights in a way which makes sense but right now we are not not able to reuse uh, the clear dividing line and the clear package which was uh, i mean of course it's a largely invented uh, retrospective notion but simplified the question when you were left and right and that's why i said in 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 in, in this book that uh, it it she said it very well actually it's a redefinition of what is left and right left meaning trying to move to the terrestrial and uh, right means trying to stay in the modernist uh, organ organization to do it. So this is why geosocial class, I've done a lot of work since in the last five years on geosocial classes because, and of course this is very similar to many things that Chantal uh, herself uh, wrote about. It would be great if we had geosocial classes because we would recognize again, uh, 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 not exactly party politics, it's a bit premature, but at least a clear range of disputes where we could align in one direction uh, or, in, or in, in, in the other. The problem uh, is that the, the geosocial classes themselves have to be described. And uh, this is again linked to the work I'm doing now uh, with uh, what I call self-description of territories or the word is not very uh, easy. And why? Because it's the way Geosocial classes have to be defined bits and pieces because we cannot just put them into a box and say this is the left, this is the right. Well, we have to redo. And the inequality uh, are very difficult. There is actually a very good book just out now by uh, Lucas Chancel. Uh, I, I could do some advertisement of that with Harvard University Press, uh, which is exactly a calc trying to calculate in some specificity these new geosocial classes. He doesn't use the word, but it's exactly that. Uh, trying to link inequality in both uh, ecological question and social question, uh, something which I'm sure Chantal uh, knows a lot about it. So uh, we are not yet there, <laughs> but but the the multiplicity of fight is, is everywhere, and the unity, the unification of those fight inside a democratic space is nowhere to be seen. And I think here uh, I have to say that I was more optimistic when I was writing. Uh, politics of nature than I am now, uh, because precisely of the Trump years, it's much more difficult uh, even to imagine uh, what is a constitution of democracy. But the question is essential uh, because it's the only way to uh, tackle the serious question of the, what is called now populism. I'm sure she disagree with, and she's like me, she disagrees with the word, uh, which is an attachment to a soil of some sort. And uh, the question of the soil as attachment to the soil is completely different if you are terrestrial uh, or, or if you define it in terms of identity. So this is why, again, I'm interested in description of territory. This is my work on critical zone. There's a big exhibition right now, close, unfortunately, in Karlsruhe about that, which is, where, I think that's where the, the, the work has to be done now. Can we retrieve the people who are calling themselves populist uh, by providing a different view of what it is to be on earth. <laughs> I mean, yeah. literally, literally, yeah. <laughs> very yeah. literally. Because that was, is something that you seem uh, to address frequently and, and maybe slightly worry about it. And I it noticed it your uh, recent conversation with Hartmut Rosa, um, that to to stress the this, this sense of ter, ter, territoire, of ter, terroir, I must say in French, this sense of uh, links to the soil, also maybe links to the past traditions and, and your, your sense is often interpreted as, and also, uh, well, everywhere, but also especially in France, maybe as seen as a kind of, uh, of rootedness that is uh, 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 sees people are not rooted as enemies uh, uh, and uh, seeing the other as a kind of intruder and not part of this uh of this of this of this link or this of or this uh, symbiosis uh, of 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 the, the human with the with his surroundings um it, what's the best way to to counter that you think the the, the question of soil should not be left to the right mm -hmm. <laughs> it has been left 
to go right by the left, <laughs> actually. Uh, this was done, shown very beautifully by Polanyi uh, in, his, in his great uh, book, but it has been shown by many historians since. Uh, the, the question is completely reversed now that the, the, the definition of soil itself has been modified. The soil of identity, I don't know, of, the, the, of Poland, or uh, uh, of Madame Le Pen, uh, is a soil which has no existence. Actually, it's a, it, you, you don't live on identity. You live on, on, on earthworms, <laughs> and you live on, 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 on CO2, and you live on, on vegetables, and so on and so forth. And all, none of those things actually fit inside the, the limits of a, of a nation state, or, and a, of even less in the limit of an ethnical definition of a nation state. So, but the vocabulary of rootedness, the vocabulary of uh, uncertainty vis-a-vis -vis what has been passed, uh, the whole uh, ethos of progress, uh, which has been uh, articulated uh, by the left, uh, really literally now lacks a ground. So in terms of ground, <laughs> we, 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 the terrestrial, uh, are trying to uh, interest or vow or convince, and I think it's very important, uh, those who call themselves populist in an identity definition uh, to say, look, I mean, if you want to saw it, you'd better look at what it is. And that's why, again, the question of, of self-description is so important. I mean, what do you depend on? That, that's my argument I've made many times that uh, if a Brexit had been, what do you depend on? And not what is to be English, which is completely impossible answers to give. Uh, they suddenly have, would have realized that they depend on, on, on Europe in, in hundreds and thousands of ways. So question in terms of identity don't define well what it is to be rooted in a place. And actually uh, in the exhibition uh, on critical zone, we show what it means to have roots. I mean, <laughs> roots, roots is, a, is a serious scientific question. It's not uh, well uh, understood by the notion of identity. Our third guest is Peter Paul Verbeek, a philosopher of, philosopher of science, and he was part of the ju jury who awarded you the uh, Spinoza lens. And he has uh, uh, a science question, but also a, a climate question. Uh, Peter. Dear Bruno Latour, it is a great honor for me to have the opportunity to congratulate you on the awarding of the Spinoza lens prize 2020, and also to have the opportunity to ask you a question. Now, being a philosopher of technology, I obviously was asked to ask you a question about technology. <laughs> but given the fact that I'm really working at the intersections between the philosophy and ethics of technology with science and technology studies and with design research, I would like to include those perspectives in my question as well. My question is actually quite basic. Your recent and current work focuses on nature and on the earth, while your earlier work focused on science and technology. Now, of course, you've never given up that perspective, but still, how to connect your views on technology in your earlier work with your current work on Gaia and on the politics of nature? Now that we have a better understanding of the politics of nature, what politics of technology belongs to that? Or maybe in other words, how to take technology down to earth as well? Let me explain this a little bit. Your work has inspired the philosophy of technology a lot. Your way of breaking through the modernistic split between subjects and objects, in which the human subject can only be active and objects are mute and silent, has enabled us to expand the notion of agency towards things, has made it possible then also to raise new questions about the relationships between humans, technologies and societies. Technologies are not just tools, technologies affect us, they play an active role in our societies. But to understand this way in which technologies affect us, we should also not revert to technology with a capital T as a broad social and cultural phenomenon as the classical views on technology had it. We should look at actual technologies and have practical engagement with them. So that's how you contributed to the field of philosophy of technology. And this notion of technological agency is still debated a lot in the field, especially when it is extended to moral agency. Some are still extremely worried about this idea. It seems to work like a kind of narcissistic offense to people depriving humans of their monopoly on action, on morality. But many also actually got inspired by the possibility to moralize technology, to think about technology in moral terms. 
And what's more, when technologies help to shape human actions and decisions, this does not only open up new directions in theory, but also in, in practice, in practices of design. How can we design technologies in a responsible way then, when we can take into account how they help to shape our actions, our practices, our interpretations, our ways of dealing with the world? Now that brings me to my question, how to connect this approach to technology as an active part of society with a moral significance to your work on nature? your work on the earth. Some people have already taken up your idea of technological morality uh, in the context of sustainability, for instance, by studying how technologies can be designed to influence the behavior of people in a more sustainable direction. But the implications of your work actually seem to reach much further. Technologies inform also our understanding of nature and of the earth. Technologies could even help to give a voice to nature. The, the, the network of relations in which technologies and we ourselves are connected help to shape even what nature can be for us, what the earth is to us. So if technologies are to give a voice to nature, how should they do that? Who should do that? How should humans take responsibility for that? How, how could your work on nature and the earth inspire technology studies, inspire the ethics and philosophy of technology, and maybe most importantly, what kinds of responsible design could take technology down to earth? Yeah, those are very big questions again. Again, <laughs> yes, we, we need an hour. <laughs> this is a celebration, but uh, I'm sure there will be uh, a few points that you want to address. Yeah, I'm very interested by, by Peter Paul's uh, question because uh, actually since I worked uh, on technology and then moved to uh, Gaia, so to speak, uh, I feel exactly the same uh, question, which is that the, the capacity which I learned from the work with my friend in the critical zone science, uh, all of the uh, activities uh, of uh, bacteria, uh, life forms, uh, trees and, and so on, and including humans, to modify uh, the niche in which they find themselves actually is very inspired by the science and technology studies for uh, human technologies. And, and I tell you, now with the notion of Anthropocene, it's hard to make the distinction when you begin to study a technology I don't know about in polders in, in Holland and uh, there uh, something else which has to be uh, studied by geologists or something which has been studied by earth scientists. Actually, earth scientists is full of questions which are completely connected to but God, I mean, there are snakes, but God, I mean, there are snails and there are lots of others, lots of other entities which have always been doing, uh, 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 building their own environment, so to speak. So between a city uh, made by humans uh, ingenu ingenuity with stones, which are themselves, in case of Paris at least, entirely made of uh, living, fossilized living organism, uh, which made their, their, their uh, shell, uh, there is a continuity. It has been studied many times by people like Leroy Gouran in France, a great uh, archaeologist and philosopher of technique, as, as I'm sure uh, Professor Webik knows about. So uh, I, I'd go in the same direction. Now, does that has an influence on uh, design? I've worked a little bit on design, but I'm not a specialist of that. Uh, I'm not sure. But it seemed to be that the young people who are associated with this price, if I remember, uh, are doing this uh, fairly well, if, I, if, I, if one regime uh, told me. Does that have an influence? I don't know. But what I'm doing actually now um, in, in the domain of critical zone is exactly in that line. It is trying to mix together uh, the skills of uh, STS, I mean, for which, the Holland, of, for which Holland is very well known. Um, because of all the uh, older STS people, and uh, the study of Gaia, because it's too artificiality. Gaia is artificial. Gaia is nothing natural in Gaia. Nature is not natural. The whole of Gaia should not be there. It has been there because it made itself there, and it transformed its condition to be favorable. It was not favorable at all. I mean, contrary to what some scientists say, it made the condition favorable. Now, it turns out that some aspect of our own technology made the condition disfavorable, and this is the Anthropocene. So I think the Anthropocene is exactly the locus where 
uh, probably a very big question should be should be looked for. Thank you so much. And I'm still very sorry that we cannot celebrate, but I'm sure everybody who will see our interview will open a, a nice bottle of Burgundy wine uh, to toast on your uh, winning the um, Spinoza lens. And I hope uh, we could celebrate in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. That was a very inspiring conversation. Thank you, Bas Heine, Donna Haraway, Chantal Mouffe and Peter Paul Verbeek, and of course, especially Bruno Latour for your thoughts. And now it's time for the more formal, but also festive part of this ceremony. And I would like to invite Femke Halsema, mayor of Amsterdam, city of Spinoza, to deliver her celebration speech to the laureate of 2020, Bruno Latour. Mr. Latour, it's an honor to welcome you to Amsterdam in digital form. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. One year ago, I was honored to host a gathering of some of the most learned and wise people in the land, the jury of the Spinoza lens and other distinguished intellectuals. Everybody was in high spirits. We shook hands, patted on shoulders and clinked glasses. Then we sat down and pulled our chairs closely together to listen to the chairman of the jury announcing the laureates of the 2020 Spinoza Lens. Please do not be confused by Donald Trump's claims that he won this prestigious award. The independent jury has elected Mr. Bruno Latour in a completely fair process. If it is true that some philosophers have become more relevant during the pand pandemic, while others may have become less relevant, it is certainly the case that Mr. Latour has become more relevant in the COVID crisis. It would be difficult to imagine an event in which the social, the technological and the biological aspects of our world has become so intertwined. At these moments, we turn to philosophers to help us to make sense of the world. Mr. Latour's work on science, technology and the relation between humans and non-humans is, ju is doing just that. But Mr. Latour has not been awarded for his relevance in this pandemic, but his re relevance in the long term. I personally support the jury's choice with much enthusiasm. Mr. Latour's work is of great value for a city like Amsterdam. And let me explain. Bas Heine just mentioned the book O Atterir. It was translated into Dutch as Waar kunnen we landen? The work argues for a new political orientation that escapes the false, false promises of both globalism and nationalism. Globalization, once the driving force of freedom and, uh, of freedom and emancipation, has produced unacceptable levels of inequality. Free trade was linked to growing wealth and opportunity, but the depletion of natural resources and climate change is making our planet poorer and poorer. World-scale integration promised us openness and diversity, but has delivered uprooted communities and a crisis of belonging for too many people. Mr. Latour demonstrates that the flight back to the nation state offers no solution. Border walls don't keep the dangers out, but lock us, lock us in a false sense of safety. The idea of ethnic homogeneous nations don't build communities back, but fuel mistrust 
and cynicism. The COVID crisis this all too, makes this all too clear. Globalization has caused the rapid spread of the virus, but the science to cure the, dis the disease, the efforts to restore our economies and societies, and the measures to reduce the risk of more pan pandemics must all be international. Bruno Latour thus arrives at the question, where can we land? As the mayor of a hospitable city, I would like to offer such a place. Not just the city of Amsterdam, but other cities as well, can overcome the false promises of state sovereignty and the dangers of globalization. Mr. Latour wrote, and I quote, the most basic right of all is to feel safe and protected, especially at a moment when the old protections are disappearing. And this is the meaning of the history that remains to be discovered. How can we revive edges, envelopes, protections? How can we find new footing while simultaneously taking into account the end of globalization, the scope of migration, and also the limits placed on the sovereignty of nation states that are henceforth confronted by climate change. I believe that a city like Amsterdam can, prov can provide such protection. Not, if, not of illusionary borders, but the protection that communities and public space can provide. Cities should be and can be open and look beyond national borders to cooperate of tackling global challenges like climate change, inequality, and the dangers of disruptive technologies. If we are able to reach a high level of energy e e efficiency, circularity of resources and local food production, we can reduce our dependency on unsustainable glo globalization. Mr. Latour, all of this will not be easy, but because of you, we are not lacking intellectual inspiration. Your work is a cause, not for easy optimism, but for hope. This award is well deserved. Congratulations. And I say this on behalf of the Spinoza Lens jury and many Amsterdammers who admire your work. We hope that in the near future you can come to Amsterdam in physical form. Then we can shake your hand, we can clink our glasses and pull our chairs close together to listen to what you have to say. Congratulations and thank you for your attention. Yes. Bruno Latour, there you are. The floor is yours. A sort of a magic trick. <laughs> the statue, which was a minute ago <laughs> in the hands of a mayor, is actually now through the screen, arrived in my hands. And it's a fairly beautiful statue of a very monkish Spinoza. I mean, it's very, very serious and severe. And it's a good occasion to thank Mrs. the Mayor and, of course, the, the jury and the board of the Spinoza Lens, and especially the Embassy of the North Sea. I learned a lot from them and all the sponsors. But I'd like also to add the publishing houses, Boom and Octavo, who have been kind enough to translate some of my work in uh, Dutch. I'd like to add also the philosophers, uh, 
who have influenced me coming from Holland over the years, especially Anne-Marie Moll, uh, who studied in Paris many, many years ago and with whom I've uh, been friend and I've followed her work for all those years. Gerard de Vries, who is always <laughs> interrogated by me every time I try a new project. And Wiebe Baike, with whom I have a long tradition of philosophy of technology that Peter Paul knows uh, very well. And uh, especially Nort Mares, who is now in England. Um, I hope maybe the Brexit will make her come back to Holland, I don't know. And uh, I was very influenced by her work uh, as well. So for me, uh, especially because I had the privilege of having another Spinoza's Prize granted to me by the University of Amsterdam in 2005, for me, Amsterdam is also the land and the city of philosophy. And I'm very pleased to thank those friends of mine. I'd like to mention that one of the originality of his prize is also to associate a living um, thinker, philosopher, with a dead thinker, uh, in this case, Alan Turing. It turns out that I was extremely interested at one point in my life by Alan Turing, especially because of his extraordinary paper on the imitation game. I'm sure there has been lots of celebration of Turing as well during those two years of a Spinoza lens, but there is a connection between, even if it might not be obvious to uh, people between his uh, paper uh, and my work, uh, because the paper, which is supposed to be the paper at the origin of formalism, is incredibly bizarre. I don't know if people read it because they would be absolutely amazed by the number of strands. It talks about God, it talks about families, it talks about mother beating their kids. It, mean, it talks about organization of all sorts, paperwork. It's an extraordinary mess of things because it's a non-formal description of what will later become formalism. So this paper, of course, had been very influential also for my good friend, Richard Power, the great novelist. And when he was writing Galatea 2.0, I was, of course, corresponding with him about this non-formal definition of formalism, which touched upon a lot of things that Peter Paul Verbeek mentioned in his um, question time, that is the link between what we now call Gaia and uh, the study of technology. Well, it turns out that we are now linked the two, as I said before, because the lived environment built by the creatures, as uh, Donna Harry would say, and the built environment built by humans engineers has now clashed, so to speak. But the tool of philosophy of technology for which, if I understood right, the award was given to me. The tool of philosophy of technology are even more apt now to tackle the question of Gaia, which is, of course, what I'm now interested in it. But it would be, of course, meaningless to give a, a little speech of thanks without thinking about the birthday of Benedict Spinoza. And especially as it was mentioned, Madame, in the, your introduction, because of a tractatus for which I have, of course, a very, very soft uh, uh, mind and heart because uh, he was writing it at a time of war unexpectedly in Amsterdam. And he had to write about a topic which is still with us, which is the question of religion and the link with theology and politics, as everybody knows. And this is a very important feature of my own understanding. This is the work I've been doing. If we now talk philosophy for five seconds, the mode of existence. Of course, there are lots of uh, discussion with Spinoza. I read the ethics every year almost, even though I'm not Spinoza uh, scholar. There is a lot of connection between uh, this question of the mode of existence. After all, mode is also a technical term in uh, ethics, and uh, the work uh, of Spinoza 
precisely on this question of finding a right uh, tool and a right connection between what the truth of religion and the truth of reason and politics can do. So even though the solution of having a pluralism of modes of existence would have probably horrified um, Spinoza, even though there are many modes in his own uh, philosophy, I have always been extremely influenced by his work. So it's an immense honor and, of course, a great pleasure. And it's the first time also I got an award with a musical uh, piece beautifully uh, done. I understand for me, if can I say that? This is amazing. And uh, it's a great moment for me to celebrate the birthday of Spinoza and thank you all, especially uh, the mayor, Mrs. the mayor, with her beautiful offer, if I understood, to come to Amsterdam to drink at last and escape from this horrible um, situation of lock being locked down and having to look at those things with, skin with screen. So many thanks, many thanks for the chairwoman of this uh, ceremony and uh, many thanks again to the jury of a Spinoza Lens 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno Latour, and congratulations. I think you understood the mayor rightly, and she offered you a drink in Amsterdam, so a few drinks, so please feel invited to come over whenever it's possible. Um, may <laughs> it looks like a drink, but <laughs> it isn't one. May I express my, my gratitude for your kind and very inspiring words, and I think speaking on behalf of the board of uh, the Spinoza Prize and also of the jury, we feel deeply honored, I think, having you had uh, in our midst this evening, as such an engaged and urgent and brilliant intellectual. I hope you have a bottle of champagne in your fridge. We are not allowed uh, to have drinks in public here after eight o'clock in the Netherlands uh, in the, during pandemic. But we will toast on you tomorrow morning and your Spinoza Award at breakfast, I promise. <laughs> will be the first thing to do tomorrow morning. And I hope there will be an opportunity to toast on this award uh, in Amsterdam someday. I would like to thank all the participants for their contributions to, the, to this evening, the jury, the sponsors, um, and let me conclude by introducing Ibelisa once again with her beautiful voice while wishing everybody a pleasant evening. So, um, yeah, actually, yes, uh, Bruno, first of all, of course, congratulations. Uh, and wow, what an inspirational evening for everybody, I think. Thank you. Um, yes, we wrote that for you, <laughs> even though it was a little bit wove with an Icaro that is very old and very well known. But I wrote, inspired in the Icaro, uh, a text, it is in Spanish, I'm going to translate it, uh, uh, Icaro for, for you. <laughs> um, it was so beautiful that this down to earth uh, came so many times because that was also my inspiration. And it Sounds, it says this, look how we come down, how we aterrizar, which in Spanish is how we go down to earth, how the silence is descending and it's entering our minds, how the silence is whispering and how it's making us connect. Let's wake up and let's stand up. Earth we are, we are earth. So I'm going to sing it now. Mira, mira como, como, como baja, baja, baja y llega. Mira, mira cómo, cómo baja, baja, llega, 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 llega. Aterrizando en tu cuerpo, en tu cuerpo, llega, llega, baja, 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 baja. Aterrizando en tu cuerpo, baja, 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 baja. 
baja en tu cuerpo El silencio va descendiendo, 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 descendiendo Y va entrando, va entrando en tu mente, mentecita, mentecita Baja, baja cuerpo, baja cuerpo como el silencio, silencito, murmurita, murmurita, murmurita. El silencio, murmurita, murmurita, murmurita. La conexión, la conexión, tu, 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 tu. La mochita, la conexión tuya, tuya, tuya. Despertate, despertate, despertate. Y levántate, 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 levántate. Tierra somos, tierra somos. Tierra somos, somos tierra, tierra somos. Tierra somos, tierra somos, 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 tierra somos, tierra somos, tierra somos. Somos polvo de estrellas, de estrellas, somos polvo. En el tejido, en el tejido, tejido del cosmos. Somos tierra, somos tierra, somos, somos polvo de estrellas, de estrellas, en el tejidito del cosmos, en el tejidito del cosmos. Thank you.